my name is Kevin Mullen, chair of the board, and I'm going to call this meeting to order. I'm going to uh, um, start this meeting on a little bit of a, a sad note. Um, as we um, recognize the passing of the, the former director of health care reform at the Green Mountain Care Board, Richard Slusky. And anybody who knew Richard knew that um, he had a zest for life. He wasn't uh, afraid to share his opinions. And um, that's why we respected him so greatly. Um, I first met Richard when I was in the legislature and he testified on numerous occasions before the Health and Welfare Committee. And uh, although he rooted for the wrong teams, um, we had some great conversations and uh, we're gonna miss him. And uh, at that point, I'll turn it over to Susan Barrett because Susan uh, worked more closely with Richard than I did. And um, Susan, if you could say a few words. Sure, thank you so much, Chair Mellon. And um, you know, I can't agree with you more Kevin, in terms of how you described Richard, he was incredibly passionate, and sometimes that passion um, would be hard uh, to deal with as an executive director, but he always had his mind in the right place, and that was to help Vermonters with access to affordable, high-quality health care. And um, he, he, his work that he did here at the board for those years lives on in the work that we do every day. And I, I just want to speak for myself and for the Green Mountain Care Board staff and the board that were terribly, terribly sad uh, at his passing. And our, our, our hearts are with his family right now. And um, we pray and hope that they can get through this uh, very difficult time. But um, you know, it's 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 a it's a hard time. But we do have those memories from Richard, and I can speak for myself. I learned a tremendous amount from him. And I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair, unless you would like me to. Do you want me to talk about? Um, I just have a brief public comment announcement. If you want me to get into that? Yes, why don't you proceed with the executive director's report? Thank you. Um, so just the ongoing public comment period that we have had up since February of this year, that we are uh, taking any public comment regarding a potential next agreement with CMMI on an all-payer model. and. Any of those comments are being shared with our colleagues at the uh, Agency of Human Services and the Director of Healthcare Reform, as well as the governor's office as they are leading those negotiations on a next model. And just in terms of the scheduling, we have a TBD for our meeting for next week on the 29th. Um, we will see how things go today, um, but if we don't need to have a meeting next week, we won't. Um, and then our schedule for January will be posted uh, towards the end of next week so folks can um, see what we have planned uh, next year. And I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, next on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, December 15th. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, December 15th, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. Also, I just want to uh, let the public know that we do have a new board member. He will be starting on January 2nd. His name is Tom Walsh. Um, he is a PhD. He um, started his career in physical therapy and has immersed himself in academia, um, both at Dartmouth and for Boise State in Idaho. Um, he's a member of the Joint Commission here in Vermont and um, has a deep passion for healthcare reform. And we look forward to working with him starting in January. So with that, I'm going to um, move to um, the 2022 Medicare benchmark proposal. 
and I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Lindbergh. Sarah. Okay, my computer froze for just a minute. Are people able to hear me? We are. And okay, we can see your that was scary for a moment. <laughs> um, and you can see my screen all right. Yes. Great. All right. So uh, we're here to uh, finish up the recommendation for the benchmark and potentially vote on it. Um, so we have a little bit of follow up from last week to start with. One is uh, showing my work about the Medicare premium calculation and then uh, giving you uh, the exact headroom I'm anticipating for our performance to date for the Medicare program. And then we'll talk about the recommendation and vote if you're feeling it. <laughs> Uh, so the total trend basically is weighted about half and half. 51% uh, is Part B claims and 49% are the Part A or, or inpatient hospital claims. And of that Part B outpatient claims, there's two different rates depending on if the member is eligible due to being age uh, 65 or older or if they are eligible due to disability. So the rates and the rates of change were a little bit separate for that population. So of the 51% that is in Part B, 86% of those expenditures are associated with people uh, age 65 and older and 14% are associated with the uh, disabled beneficiaries. But wait a minute. 7.3, I thought you said 5.5 last week. So uh, recent <laughs> event is that uh, Congress uh, passed legislation uh, to extend Medicare's exemption from sequestration. So sequestration is something that's happening federally across the board. It's not just a Medicare thing where uh, they started deducting 2% off the top of federal expenditures. Uh, it started in the Obama administration in uh, 2013, I believe. And so it was going to be reinstituted for calendar year 2022, um, but some last minute changes have uh, postponed that. So the current uh, legislation says that it would be reduced at, uh, it would be reinstated at a reduced rate in April at 1%, so April, May, and June would have a 1% sequestration, and then it would regress back to the 2% sequestration. I think um, because, you know, I think there's a lot to be seen about if and how this pans out, um, I would recommend kind of taking that factor back out of the calculation and dealing with it at settlement, um, because it, it's a lot easier to deal with it then than kind of assume it's going to happen. We know it won't be 2% the whole time, though. Um, but, you know, that is something important to keep in mind with all these growth rates is that that 2% was kind of, you know, fake growth. <laughs> that was just a, a removal that wasn't really about spending so much as a federal sequestration. So, um, so if you do click through, here is the Part B announcement from the federal registers. Um, gosh, I can't remember what it's called, something about examination exhibits. But um, you can see uh, we take the costs, we back out the cost sharing from the individuals who are actually beneficiaries. So those deductibles and co-insurance aren't on the table for the ACO. They are only at risk for what Medicare pays. So if we look at those benefits, but add back the sequestration, that's how you'll get back to my math. Um, you'll notice in red there, I've circled the contingency margin, which I did not include. Again, that has to do with the uncertainty associated with um, additional COVID expenditures, which at this point are omitted from the ACO's risk. And also Adel Adel <laughs> the Alzheimer's drug that's very expensive that may or may not actually be approved by Medicare. So if it is not, um, you know, even if it were approved, and that's a big if, um, we would make sure that the ACO was not at risk for that completely new benefit. So it seemed appropriate to exclude that from the calculation. So that's how I came up with my numbers. Uh, so that is why instead of a 5.5% trend rate, I'm recommending a 7.3 trend rate. It's the same principle, just uh, adjusting for that sequestration amount. So the Green Mountain Care Board decision really is choosing something, in my judgment, no lower than 3.5% up to the maximum trend, which is 10.4%. Um, I show with the current experience estimates what that would sugar out to. Um, so uh, if with a 3.5% trend, the total amount of risk uh, presented to the ACO with a 2% corridor is 10.9 million. That creeps up to 11.6 million with a max trend. 
However, uh, we know that we're going to lose additional beneficiaries over the course of the year uh, due to the attrition. So um, if we assume that is the same in 2022 as it was for the benchmark population in 2021, uh, that would go down to 9.9 .9 million to 10.5 million of risk up or down for the ACO with a 2% corridor. Uh, I think it probably will end up being a little bit lower than that, but time will tell. Um, so I guess the the kind of the take home point here is that with that two percent corridor, the trend rate doesn't like do much for the bottom line. So in terms of where we're standing uh, for performance, um, so on the left hand uh, part of the screen, you'll see our annual growth. That is not what we're actually on the hook for according to the agreement, but we always check to see if we're on track. So we're looking for a uh, three point five to four point three percent annual growth. We're gonna blow that out of the water in 2021, understandably. We would blew it under the water in 2020, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, the annual target was 4.2%. Um, my our estimates are coming in from the nine to fifteen percent range. Again, a lot of uncertainty about what um what has left for us in 2021 here. Um, and that's true for both populations, the ESRD population, uh, the target was 2.3%. Again, uh, the growth there is a little less dramatic uh, just because their needs tend to be more stable and less sensitive to um, elective, uh, type, elective type procedures. Obviously a lot of that um, preventative care is taking its toll, but um, they need the care come what may. So uh, our growth rates are set for 2022, 10.4% for the non-ESRD population and 7.6% for the ESRD. But again, what we are on the hook for is the growth to date. So our compounding growth to date using this range of estimated annual growth would be between about half a percentage point below zero up to almost a percentage point above zero for the non-ESRD population, which is well below the growth target of 3.9%. Uh, we, have, we have up to 5.2% um, over the life of the agreement so far, assuming the not factoring in any extensions for the uh, non-ESRD population. And then uh, below that, the ESRD population is varying uh, from negative 2.4% to 0.1%, which is well below the 2.9%, and we would have to grow up to that 3.9%. So that is where we stand. A lot of confusing things, but I think the message is we've got plenty of room to grow. Uh, you know, if Medicare were to grow by 20% in 2022, we would still meet these targets. Uh, however, we would likely not meet the all payer total cost of care targets. So that's the 35 to 4.3% for all Vermonters. Um, so our margin there as a state is again wide, but estimated to be between five and a half to 16.7%. So that's kind of our total headroom through 2022 um, from 2017. And so if I was just trying to uh, estimate at a high level, so if the Medicare trend for the ACO were set at 3.5%, we would expect the, the all payer growth contribution to be 0.6%. If we set it at 7.3, it would be 1.4%. And if we set it at 10.4, um, we would already have about 2.1% of growth in the all payer, um, which, you know, that would mean that the, you know, if the bottom end of our, our headroom is right, that would mean that the rest of non ACO Medicare, commercial, Medicaid would all have to grow by 3.4%, which makes me a little nervous <laughs> that that doesn't seem like it's likely but um these things all add up i guess is the point um so your decision uh which is uh you know never an easy one but is uh deciding on the trend rate to use in the benchmark i think there are really um three functional options i think it's using the 7.3 that i'm recommending using the maximum trends allowable or going with a re retrospective trend like we used in 2020 and 2021. Um, the good news is I don't think there are any wrong answers there. Um, the bad news is I don't think that there's necessarily a right answer, and that's uh, just a hard decision to make. But uh, I think they're all ones that we can live with as a state. 
Uh, but to inform your decision making, we did receive one public comment on this topic, and that came from One Care Vermont. And uh, their comment um, agrees with all the uncertainty in the air and uh, kind of co-signs on the idea that we should uh, revisit the 2021 experience to make sure that we get that right in the calculation. And they expressed their opinion that the maximum allowable trend is the appropriate approach so that we may maximize federal funds and provide financial arrangements to healthcare providers that are in line with Medicare Advantage. Um, unfortunately, there wasn't really a lot of, um, I didn't, th that was just kind of a statement. There wasn't any additional material to help me understand why they thought 10.4 was the right number or why um, making sure that healthcare providers are aligned um, in this kind of payment arrangement is the right plan, but that's, that's what the comment said. Um, so, my, uh, the staff's analysis about using the maximum trend kind of boils down to these points. Um, one is that, again, with that 2% risk corridor, um, the maximum trend would um, increase the potential savings or loss to the ACO by something in the range of $200,000 to $300,000 total. Um, my guess would be it'd be closer to the $200,000. Um, so um, in the grand scheme of things, you know, not, not a lot of money that would be, you know, kind of left on the table here. Um, I also want to point out that uh, the agreement does say that our duty in setting these benchmarks is that they are set in such a way that enables us to achieve the financial targets in the agreement. So as I was trying to say before, using that max trend um, does make it a little, um, you know, a little bit more uncomfortable uh, to meet those targets. I should say that um, additional savings generated by the model still counts for the total cost of care. So um, it would only probably add about a tenth of a percent to our growth rate, um, but it, you know, it, it's not like we don't have to factor in those additional funds in our our accountability. Um, and you know, I I just haven't seen any other evidence that suggests 10.4 is a reasonable estimate for the growth uh, from 2021 to 2022. Um, the call letter, which again was generated generated in January of 2021, is the only place I've seen numbers that high. And I worry that um, you know taking advantage of that um, probably too high estimate uh, just would jeopardize some of the trust that CMS has in us in you know making um, decisions that are both good for Vermont and good um, in the grand scheme of things. So I guess I worry that <laughs> much more federal money might be left in the table if we jeopardize some of that trust um, down the line. So. Uh, so my recommendation, same theory, but a different number. So recommending that we follow the Medicare premiums that were set and uh, use a rate of 7.3% uh, in both the non-ESRD and ESRD benchmarks, and that uh, we should include in advance of the full uh, amount of the blueprint for health payments of $9,073,982, which again, the ACO would be accountable for um, when the savings are calculated at settlement. So that was a little fast. I'm sorry I had too much coffee this morning. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Are there um, board comments or questions for Sarah? I just have one quick one, Sarah. Could you just go over, uh, assuming that we accept the staff recommendation of a 7.3, can you just go over it? I remember it was in your original slide deck, and I wish I had it brought it with me today. Um, but sort of the caveats, should Omicron you know, exceed even the most abysmal expectations that we already have for them. You know, what were some of the off ramps? Can you just go over that again? Yeah. So um, one is is again revisiting our 2021 experience to make sure that um, if anything um, super unexpected happens these last few weeks of 2021, we've accounted for that. Two is to monitor the trends that we're seeing and developing, and the main ones we're worried about, um, where I'm worried about, is um, what additional uptake of Medicare Advantage does to the remaining population of traditional Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries. Uh, there is uh, the kind of uh, increased severity of care needed to address uh, the people who are presenting for care after deferring care that should not have been deferred. There is the need to refer care out of state that normally wouldn't be true due to our um, capacity limits. And finally, there, um, yeah, if COVID comes back into play, um, we would need to make sure that the target and baseline are adjusted accordingly. So, uh, you know, and 
if things are looking really nuts, uh, there's nothing to say we can't amend our proposal and go to a retrospective trend. Great. Thank you. I just wanted that brought back up. Thank you. I appreciate yeah, no it. No problem. <laughs> Other questions or comments for Sarah? Yeah, I, have a, I have a question. I'm just trying to get some perspective on the slide. It might be a couple before here that's up on the screen having to do with the 2% quarter and the $200,000 negative and $300,000 positive. Um, just trying to get up this one here. Um, so it's savings and losses, um, <clears throat> uh, 200 to 300. If that were the numerator in, in a calculation, what would the denominator be? Because your, your characterization of that is that it's not a lot of money. And I agree in the scheme of things, it's probably not a lot of money. But just to get us, so if I do the simple math of saying, you know, 250,000 is 2% and uh, do the, roll the math out to wherever that comes out to is probably quite a few million. Um, is, is is that fair? Um, so to be clear, um, this is the, the sum total um, of using, instead, if you move from a 7.3% trend on the benchmark to 10.4%, um, get, because the ACO is using such a narrow risk corridor, in total, it changes by this range of two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars. So, um, in terms of leaving federal money on the table, um, I just I don't. Yeah, it, it doesn't seem like a lot of money. So, you know, the the total risk corridor right now we're looking at. So this is kind of another way to think about it. So with us, so at settlement, we're estimating the up or down risk for the ACO would be ten point two million dollars, with a seven point three percent trend, and it would be ten point five million if you go to the ten point four percent trend. So that's kind of the additional risk, um, additional potential savings that would be. Uh, potentially not maximized. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, other board questions or comments for Sarah? If not, we'll open it up for public comment. Does any member of the public wish to comment on the 2022 Medicare benchmark um, proposal that's in front of us? Uh, so I do see a hand raised, Vicki Lohner. Vicki, are you there? You're on mute, Vicki. Yeah, I know I need a t-shirt. You're on mute. So <laughs> thank you, Chair Mullen. And thank you, Sarah, for all your hard work and trying to get to um, a reasonable uh, trend rate calculation for the all payer ACO model. We still continue, as we as we noted in our letter, um, feel like in order to maximize federal dollars, and I'll just note that even under the current corridor, the amount of savings and loss that the ACO might be able to recoup will almost be completely depleted um, by the funds going out to the Blueprint and the SASH program. And so that's a factor in this is that there needs to be some sort of reward opportunity that's left on the table for those providers that are willing to take both financial and clinical risk in the program. The call letter um, and the APM agreement does allow for the 10.4%. And if at any time it would make sense, um, especially since there's so much uncertainty, to allow for that type of growth rate it's now our federal and local health systems are in crisis. Um, and I think they need the greatest degree of certainty that they can have right now. I would also hate um, for this program to become way less attractive than other off the shelf Medicare programs or Medicare Advantage programs that might offer better financial alternatives to this. So. Again, all my comments are in line with the public comment letter that OneCare wrote, and we continue to maintain our position of maximizing the rate as we move forward. So thank you. 
Thank you, Vicki. Is there other public comment? Jeff Tiemann. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to say appreciate you and the and the board um, recognizing the staff recommendation to underline Vicky's point a little bit. Um, as Mike Del Treco commented a week or two ago, I believe we do see the logic of maximizing the federal dollar, especially at a time when hospitals are managing so much uncertainty um, and the labor costs alone that are creating, um, you know, a lot of that um, difficult space. So. And then just also to sort of agree with what board member Holmes said about the need to monitor changes, um, given everything that's going on and all the uncertainty that could still be coming um, so that we could adjust if circumstances call for that. But I think hospitals need to be properly resourced um, to, to make reform happen. And if we deprive them of that oxygen, um, anything that sort of limits their ability to, to get out of the pandemic and invest in reform, we should think carefully about. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Next, I'll call on Mary Alice Bisbee. Uh, Mary Alice, you're muted. Okay, hello. Um, I've never commented before, but I just think that uh, expecting this 10.5% uh, increase is ridiculous. And uh, I, I am just not for, for um, um, continuing the contract at all. And I, I just think that uh, Medicare Advantage is, is raising rates on uh, people and maybe it's not costing the state more money, but it's costing individuals more money and they don't even know it. That's my comment. Thank you, Mary Alice. Is there other public comment? Is there other public comment? Hearing none, um, going back to the board, does any board member wish to make a motion at this time? I'm happy to make a motion. Um, and But before I do, I just wanted to talk a little bit about how I'm thinking about this. Um, so I've been, so where I've been mulling over the last week is between the 7.3 and the 10.4 uh, trend. Um, because in general, I do think it's important to maximize federal funding, um, especially in a time of uncertainty. However, the 10.4%, while it is allowed, is not particularly mathematically, actuarially, or factually justified that in terms of the evidence that I've seen. Um, if you know there was additional actuarial or other information that One Care had, I wish that they had provided that to us because that would uh, give us a way to justify uh, with facts uh, that trend. But that trend is assumes that the prior year trend was um, much lower. And we know that in our case, our providers actually uh, didn't receive that trend. They received um, a retrospective benchmark. So um, because of those factors, I don't feel like I have a factual basis to go with the 10%. So that's my that's my explanation, but I'm I'll make the motion now, which is that I move that we approve uh, the staff recommendation um, of the trend. And actually let me, Sarah, could you pull the slides back up so that I have it in front of me? Sorry, I didn't. I didn't pull them up separately. It's 7.3 for both, but I'll grab it for you. Great, that's great. So okay. the staff recommended trend of 7.3 for non-ESRD and ESRD bench ACO benchmark um, with the guardrails uh, included in the proposal to assess the 2021 estimated experience with actuals and adjust if necessary, monitor 22, 2022 closely to determine if the trend requires revision and ask that uh, staff come back to the board should that be the case and ensure that the baseline and performance year have the same inclusions and exclusions in the total cost of care. And I would 
also move that we include the advance of the 9,073,982 for the blueprint and SASH programs. Is there a second? I'll second it. Is there further discussion? Yeah, I, um, I, you know, I generally, uh, you know, sometimes the argument for leaving federal money on the table is a tough, uh, uh, is an easy argument to make. Um, but, but sometimes there are, you know, kind of future downstream costs to that too. And uh, um, so I, I just want to ask Sarah, relative to Robin's comment about no actuarial um, uh, evidence uh, to that justifies the 10.4 percent. Um, is that something that uh, you have any insights on about? Yeah, so everything I've seen, seen since the call letter is pointing to lower growth from 2021 to 2022. So again, that um, that projection was released in January of 2021. Um, so we didn't even have any 2021 experience to estimate what was going to happen in 2022. So um, that's what I, you know, that's why I thought the premium announcement for Medicare was the most recent actuarial evidence of what Medicare itself thinks it's going to grow at from 2021 to 2022. And my point, Tom, is if someone was able to say, well, our situation in Vermont is different, here's an actuarial argument or a mathematical argument for why this trend is justified given the Vermont specific circumstances as opposed to the circumstances under which the call letter was done, then I, that I would find totally compelling, but we don't have that. Other discussion? Just another quick question, Sarah, for you. I think the guardrails are so important uh, and the monitoring and all of that that's in the motion. And I'm just wondering if you could just share a bit about the timetable on that. Um, when we'll have an update on whether or not this 7.3 was the appropriate, if that's what the board decides, or how does that work time-wise with, with- Yeah, kind of sure. <laughs> yeah. So uh, around April of 2022, we'll be able to um, get a better handle on where 2021 landed. So that's the important first step. Uh, we'll have an inkling of what's starting to emerge in January at that point, January and in February, which I think is where uh, the nation will probably be hardest hit by the Omicron surge. So we'll have some early indicators there. Um, I also think, you know, I expect there'll be further deferred care in that period. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's something that we'll have to do on an ongoing basis. Uh, and it's something that, you know, we partner with not only CMMI, but One Care. Um, I feel fortunate to have great working relationships on both sides um, in on the data side of things. So that, and you know, it's it's been very collegial and um, we've worked well together on coming to reasonable solutions in the past. So. Uh, it, yeah, I, 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 uh, I think if anything, I could see coming before you in July and saying, you know what, I, I recommend a retrospective trend. I think we'll have a pretty good sense of uh, how things are unfolding by then. Other board discussion? If not, and Robin, um, it was hard for me to keep up. My pen was dying, but I believe that, uh, um, correct me where I have this wrong, I believe the motion in front of us is to um, approve a, a Medicare benchmark uh, rate uh, of the staff recommended um, rate of 7.3% for both non-ESRP, ESRD and ESRD with guardrails built in place for um, possible adjustments and requiring um, monitoring by staff um, for those possible mid-year adjustments. Further, you propose that um, the proposal would include an advance of $9,078,982 in um, shared savings for um, 
the um, blueprint and sash. Have I got that correct? I believe it's nine million seventy three thousand nine hundred and eighty two. OK, you're right. It's on the screen in front of me, so I should be Other looking than that, yes. I instead, think of my own, instead of my own writing. <laughs> so all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion carried unanimously. Thank you, Sarah. I know it's been a lot of work and we appreciate it. And uh, I know that uh, no one will ever, there's never a situation where everyone is happy. And I know you've done your best to try to make sure that um, Vermonters are, are covered under this proposal. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you. So if you could take down the screen, we're going to move to the next item on the agenda, which is um, the 2022 One Care Vermont Accountable Care Organization budget and certification. And to tee that up, I'm going to turn it over to Marissa Melamed. Marissa. Thank you, Mr. Chair and board members, and good afternoon to all. My name is Marissa Melamed. I'm the Associate Director for Health Systems Policy and functionally the Administrator and Project Director for the ACO Oversight Process for the Board. Uh, with me today is the full Green Mountain Care Board Policy Team led by uh, Sarah Kinsler uh, to assist with policy questions and discussions that might come up. Uh, also Patrick Rooney, Head of Finance for the GMCB and uh, Russ McCracken, Staff Attorney to assist us with legal and procedural issues as you prepare to vote. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. There are uh, great. Thank you. Um, there are two documents as part of the presentation today. I think I can toggle between them um, as needed. We have a couple of slides and then the list of final staff recommendations, both of which are posted on the website under ACO oversight and today's board meeting materials. Uh, I am pleased to be here today for the culmination of three months of in-depth review of the FY22 budget for One Care Vermont. Our team has put together a set of budget conditions this year that we feel provides the right level of oversight within the broad authority of the ACO statute and rule by focusing on ACO performance, financial accountability for the organization, and continued progress toward a greater share of payments in value-based arrangements. We have reviewed those conditions with you over the course of this month at several meetings uh, and have noticed a potential vote for today's meeting. I'm not going to review each and every condition today. The presentation will be fairly short. I'm gonna walk through any changes um, or highlights since last week. Um, the agenda for the presentation is uh, a, a quick summary of public comment that we received. I'll go through the final staff recommendations. Um, there is uh, board questions and discussion, public comments, uh, then the potential vote and next steps for this process. So uh, total comments that were received from 46 people. Uh, three of the 46 were received uh, since the initial December 8th staff analysis presentation, all the comments are posted on the uh, Green Mountain Care Board website. Just some broad themes of the comments that were received. Um, there was support expressed for the value of OneCare's data and analytics to providers, especially for population level insights and prevention initiatives, the value of care coordination investments enabled by uh, OneCare Vermont funding. There are also concerns expressed related to decreased population health management and mission related investments. Uh, concerns around One Care's leadership compensation and just general concerns related to One Care's performance to date. I will note that I think there we received two comments after the deadline of December 17th. Um, as we always say, the board accepts and reviews public comment at any time, um, but those uh, public those comments might not be reflected on this slide here. And we'd like to thank, um, in particular, the engagement of the public on this topic. Um, the, the, the quantity um, of, of comments that we received. Um, it's always very helpful to um, hear what, what people have to say. 
Um, and in particular, I'd like to thank um, the healthcare advocate with, who submitted comments and has a special status to ask questions, participate in the hearing, um, and um, receive confidential information. So we appreciate their collaboration on this review. Um, we also received several comments um, especially as we were trying to wrap up our recommendations directly from One Care Vermont. So the link to the final recommendation is posted in several places. You can let us know if you have trouble finding it. Um, but I'm going to toggle over to that document and uh, you can use that as a visual or you can follow along on your own. Um, just a quick note about the highlighted information, this information that's highlighted in gray. Um, this is uh, information that we have flagged um, that will be part of the FY22 reporting manual. Um, this is the manual that the board puts together annually to keep track of um, all the reports that we require OneCare to submit to us. Um, several of these reports are uh, ongoing or not um, new, you know, don't pertain to new budget order conditions. We just wanted to note relevant reports in here. So it's not part of conditions that you'd be voting on, but we think it's helpful for the board and the public to see information that is reported. So like I said, I'm not going to read through all of these. We've been through them. I'm going to say a couple of highlights and anything that has changed since uh, last week. The first one, um, there are no changes to this first condition that I did read through last week, but I want to make a quick note about it because it's um, new and, and generated a bit of um, discussion. Um, this condition moves us to a monitoring approach that emphasizes comparison to peer organizations across the country. Um, it requires one care to invest in a benchmarking tool to measure performance against other ACOs, uh, starting with Medicare as a test year and then moving to commercial and Medicaid. Um, the tool also um, will include identification of best, best practices. Um, one care will be required to report a dashboard to GMCB on the on key measures at least quarterly. Um, and staff considers the benchmarking system as a tool for ACL performance improvement. Um, this has been discussed, discussed and been in prior budget order conditions. Um, we believe that it's a tool for both ACL performance improvement and regulatory oversight. Prior attempts to develop and implement a population health and financial performance dashboard through budget orders have focused on state level data and state level variational analysis only and have not provided the GMCB with a reliable tool for assessing ACO performance uh, because it doesn't provide us uh, any meaningful comparisons. So we're hoping that this recommendation will enhance uh, that oversight. <clears throat> Moving on, uh, the the second, the second condition is around um, the reporting requirements related to the first. Then moving to the second section, payer programs and risk. There are no new uh, conditions or recommendations here since I believe our original presentation. So I'm not going to spend time on that section. Uh, the ACO budget and financials section. Again, there are no changes since our presentation on the 15th. Um, we did add a little bit more specification around what uh, One Care needs to present at their revised budget in the spring. That was discussed at last week's meeting. Um, so I don't think that we need to review that unless there are questions. Um, the major change from last week to this week is in the population health and quality section around the staff recommendation for the uh, value-based incentive fund. So last week we presented two options to you. It was to increase the level of funding that goes to the, the value-based incentive fund um, or other, or, or the, the ACO's total quality accountability program. Um, and our final staff recommendation on this is that the ACO fund uh, total quality accountability programs at a minimum of the 2021 level of 2.24 million. This includes the value-based incentive fund or other population health management investment programs linked to quality and outcomes, such as payments tied to quality in the new care coordination payment model for 2022. After last week's discussion, staff finds that while the total quality accountability may be slightly higher when all payments are considered, more of that accountability has shifted to variable settlement dollars 
and pre-funded fixed dollars have declined. More timely all-payer incentive payments decoupled from settlement provides an additional incentive and additional cash for network providers that they are able to earn. Once payer contracts are finalized, the ACL will come back to the Green Mountain Care Board with their revised budget indicating the additional funding for this change. So that is where uh, staff landed on that particular recommendation. Uh, around provider payment models, I want to make a clarification um, around uh, fixed perspective payment reporting um, that when we, we noted here what's in bold, um, that the staff continue to work to refine reporting and, and start rulemaking as previously instructed uh, at, at previous meetings. I wanted to clarify that um, we are already working um, on specifying a format and methodology for collecting data about current ACO FPP levels and targets in the updated manual. So that's reporting that um, the, the ACO submitted a report to us in July. Um, we've been working to re refine that reporting. Um, so that, that particular piece isn't lost in the reporting requirement. And with that, that brings me to the end of the changes. Uh, next, I will turn it back to you, uh, Mr. Chair, for board questions and discussion. Thank you, Marissa. I'll open it up for uh, board comment or question. I don't have a question, but I like where the staff landed on the VBIF. I think giving some flexibility in terms of how those, uh, whether that's in VBIF or other pre-funded um, sort of in real time quality programs um, give some flexibility, but also uh, maintains that investment in quality. Um, I guess actually I do have one question, which is sorry, um, which is uh, when I was reviewing the final final uh, this week, it occurred to me that um, because last year we had set up the reporting manual through a condition in the budget um, that it might, we might need to do that again since those budget conditions live for the term of the budget. So um, I was thinking of proposing that we add a, just a, a condition uh, to clarify that um, you know, there will be a reporting manual and that that will be developed, maintained and revised by staff just so that it's clear um, under, it's clear legally that we've delegated that authority to, to do that. So I wanted to mention that so no one would be surprised when my motion includes it. <laughs> okay, other board members comments or questions? Yeah, I, I have um, a question. I, um, you know, once uh, um, <clears throat> a motion is made on the overall budget, I have two or three amendments uh, that I'd like to talk about. Um, one having to do with um, FPP, the other having to do with the cost shift, and uh, the third having to do with the um, uh, health benefits, the the uh, QHP um, health, health benchmark plan. But um, I, I just uh, I'm, I'm seeing that something got lost in the translation over the chaos of the last two or three days. So if Marissa, you could kind of screen up, um, I think to your last slide on on the staff recommend. Yes, right there. Um, so I had uh, we we had discussed that over the last few days, and I was left with the impression that that language um, was language that. Um, I would offer as a second um, motion um, because it was consistent with with my first motion. But but and so I have an amendment prepared, which I don't think we need to use now. That says exactly those words uh, in the in the shaded area. So um, I think between the conversations between Marissa and Sarah and Russ and I. Um, something got lost in the uh, translation, but I'm I'm happy I'm happy to accept this um, as uh, as it is and, and not not have a separate motion with that exact same language in it. Just an FYI. 
Yeah, this particular piece, um, Tom, was just to clarify. So the, the bold there in the highlighted section is what we had last week where we said staff level work to refine reporting. Um, by refine reporting, we mean what you um, have there below. So that was already sort of part of the, um, the reporting manual. But I think um, I saw Russ just popped on to help us sort this out. Um, because we want to make sure we have it right, um, what we need to put as a condition um, on their budget and what is uh, simply a reporting um, requirement for reporting of data. No, no, the language I had on the motion is exactly that verbatim, um, but it makes no difference to me whether it's um, a, a separate motion or just here in the body of the staff recommendations. Uh, I think we'll be a little less busy for everyone to leave it where it is. Okay, other board comments or questions? Not, I'll open it up for public comment. Does any member of the public wish to comment on the um, One Care uh, budget and the um, recommendations that are in front of us? And I'm going to call on um, Vicki Lohner first. Mute. I'll get it right sooner or later. So thank you, Chair Mullen. <laughs> Before I comment on the budgetary points, I wanted to thank the board for putting in place some guardrails in terms of reevaluating the trend as we move forward. I think um, the year has not closed out yet, so it's really hard to project, especially given the uncertainty that's going on and the state of COVID uh, where we might land. So we might be closer to that actuarial call letter of 10.4. So I do appreciate that. And also in that the ACO does have many blind spots in its data. And so we appreciate that the Green Mountain Care Board would be working with CMS to really evaluate where those trends are landing and in 2021. So I do want to recognize and appreciate that that's an important guardrail to put in the budget orders. So thank you for that. Uh, moving along to the budget orders, the ACO did submit a comment letter. Uh, we still hold true again to those um, comments that we made in the letter. We do believe that it's a good idea to have benchmarking data for the ACO, and we believe that that benchmarking data should be at the approval of the ACO and not at the Green Mountain Care Board. For maximum engagement and uptake, this has to be something that is provider-led and not led by regulation. So that is our main comment on this, is the goals of the all pair model were to have provider-led healthcare reform, and I think you'll have a better uptake if you leave the final approval at the ACO level. In terms of the value-based incentive fund, we do appreciate the flexibility that has been offered in looking at other programs. We are still in the process of finalizing negotiations with payers, so adjustments might be made going into 2022. I would caution and have people calibrate that currently the savings um, and risk ratios are very low and that's intentional because there's a lot of volatility right now and we don't want to put the hospitals or primary care providers at risk by very high risk margins during a time of uncertainty. And with that, that means the risk and reward at the ACO level is much lower than it has been in previous years. And so the ACO is actually investing more in um, population health programs than it will ever be able to get back to in that particular year. So hopefully in years coming towards the future, that will change, but that's not the case right now. And I just hope that is in the board members and staff's mind as we as we move forward during such a time of uncertainty. So thank you to, to Sarah and Marissa. Um, you have been working very diligently with our team 
And I believe that although we don't always agree on things, that we come into the conversation with collaboration and openness to discussion. So thank you. Thank you, Vicki. Next, I'll call on Mary Alice Bisbee. Thank you uh, again, and I do appreciate all the work you've been doing on all of this, <laughs> in spite of some of my criticisms. But uh, I think it, one thing that I'm concerned about is the deferred care uh, being used as a reason uh, for uh, making changes. I think it's much more than deferred care. Um, I am very happy that you are uh, going to have them pay for SASH and other things. I am a SASH person who receives SASH services in my house, in my public housing. So I just wanted to put that in there as uh, something that I hope. But I think that the state of Vermont could do this very well without one care and could pay for SASH and could do these other things without having a middleman who with value-based care is going to be getting, they're going to be reaping all the profits on the, on the side of the insurance companies and the ACO. That's my comment. Thank you, Mary Alice. Is there other public comment? Kevin, I'm Mike Fisher here. Hi, hey, Mike. Go ahead. Um, so good afternoon, Mike Fisher, healthcare advocate. Um, <clears throat> a couple quick comments. One is uh, I appreciate and agree with the direction on uh, benchmarking against um, high functioning ACOs. I think that's a, a, a good move. I um, appreciate the direction of the board recommendation on um, public health investments here. Um, and I always want to caution, I, I, we made a pub, we wrote a letter to you and I don't want to repeat <laughs> what, I, what I already wrote to you, but I do want to say just on a high level that we continue to be concerned that uh, the ACO is not engaging in enough of the both public health investment activities and um, intensive case management activities to have the kinds of outcomes that we're all looking for high level concern. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're muted. Thank you, Mike. Um, next, I'm going to call on Susan Aronoff. Susan. Hi, um, good afternoon, everyone. And um, thank you for all of the hard work you're doing under these circumstances and everything. I just have a question and I'm not going to go through all of the staff recommendations one by one, but just in general, and maybe this is a question uh, for Russ, I'm wondering how you envision enforcing some of the recommendations. Like let's just take specifically the one on administrative expense. It says something I don't have it in front of me, but one cares administrative expense won't shall not exceed X, what, 15 million? whatever it is this year, in this year. And so I'm just wondering, because this administrative expense issue has just been kicked down the road. You all know, well, for those of you who don't know, your first order had a limit placed on it that was going to somehow be able to be enforced in the first year. And then you kind of realized the difficulty of enforcing things in real time. So you came up with this thing of, I call it moving the goalposts of moving it to the end and saying, okay, the benefit of it, however we're going to measure that, has to exceed whatever these administrative costs have been over the years. But so now I'm wondering, I really appreciate, I'm doing the compliment sandwich. Great to have the recommendation, the recommendation, the mandate, I guess it says shall, for the administrative expense and a couple other things, shall not exceed X dollars. What happens if it does? That's my question and comment. And everyone have a great holiday. And really, I think the amount of work your staff, Mr. Chair, has done on this is tremendous. And thank you for the report you did on the public investment. Unfortunately, I didn't see it till after I filed my comments, but I've seen it since in my file and addenda, 37 million or whatever it was. I have questions about it because I have some different numbers, but that's a lot of money. 
we need to know what we're getting for our money. Thank you, Susan. Russ, are you uh, prepared to answer a question on enforcement? Mute. <laughs> yeah, I can talk about enforcement. Sorry. This is the afternoon for the muted. <laughs> I had a. Well, anyway, um, my shortcut to unmute didn't work. Um, the board has authority under its rule to enforce it, its budget order. And, um, you know, there's a. Uh, a process that we would go through um, to take remedial action, starting with putting the ACO in a corrective action plan. And if that doesn't work, we can uh, uh, enforce the, the board's order um, in court and through that process. So uh, I'm not sure if there was a different question being asked, but, but that's... Um, but specifically yeah. then, I mean, it, it appears throughout the recommendations at these shells, but specifically with administrative expense. So they've gone over, you wouldn't find that out till much later down the road. What would enforcement look like? A budget freeze, like a staff cut? Like how would you enforce them going over administrative expense? And I'm not meaning to be difficult. I'm a recovering lawyer. I've tried to imagine what enforcement would look like. So I'm curious if you've thought it through, what you think enforcement would be for going over. This is a hypothetical where there, there's a variance in their actual versus their what they had budgeted. Is that what the, the question is? This is specifically, I could pull it up. I, it's early so they, in the, it, it, it a, says a specific number. They shall not spend more than $15 million on administrative expense. So let's say they come in and they report to you, oh, $15 million. And in April, you know, whenever you find out, it won't be in real time. Well, the first step, um, Susan, would be that the board would have to meet and to have a discussion um, and determine if um, there's just cause for enforcement before we proceeded with that enforcement. And um, so um, I think you're assuming in your question that um, there wasn't just cause for that uh, variance and what would happen in that situation. And uh, so Russ, I think if you put it in that uh, framework, maybe uh, it would help. And I, I think there's also we the board has monitoring throughout the year on on the actual financial progress of the ACO. So there is some tracking. It's not um, being blind to what's actually going on and then getting to the end of the year to find administrative costs were significantly different than what was budgeted. I'll add here that we do require quarterly financial reporting um, of both the full accountability and the entity or uh, gap level budget as we described initially. And there is a new condition this year, um, trying to find the exact number that we went over, I think at the original uh, presentation that um, one care has to be sure to provide um, updated projections for the year as well. So we'll see the budget and amount slash projections for the year. So that is our um, ability to monitor that. If Patrick wants to add anything um, here, uh, he might be on the line, but that, that's my, that would be my response. Yeah, Marissa, I'm happy to. Uh, this is Patrick Rooney, Susan. Um, <clears throat> so we wanted those projections to be built into the quarterly reporting for partially for this purpose and partially for our own monitoring that we know projections can change and um, can be relegated to the dustbin depending on activity that can occur over a quarter. But still, the point there is that it begs the question to be asked on a regular basis and communications with one care about what they anticipate on uh, ending their year at as far as 
uh, administrative expenses. And it's something that we focused on over the last couple of budget cycles, both last year and this year. So getting those projections, uh, replying with questions <laughs> that kind of attack those variances, whether up or down, um, to better inform this process. And I believe uh, we received the quarter three um, information from one care at about the time the staff was getting ready to present to the board. So with that timing in mind, it would it could play a pertinent part uh, at this time next year in the budget process, which would make it very relevant. Okay, is there other public comment? Is there other public comment? Hearing none, does any member of the board wish to make a motion? I do. Yes. Oh, you go ahead, Tom. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll try to be quick here. Uh, so my first, the, I mean, the three areas that I think are fundamental, and um, those are uh, uh, the level of fixed prospective payments on the commercial side, um, the uh, cost shift, which is, you know, the uh, ACO in their presentation to us mentioned the cost of shift twice, and it was only in relation to the Medicare benchmark at 10.4%, and thinking that that might be a windfall that would help offset the Medicare cost shift a bit. Um, and uh, the third is is the uh, essential health benefits uh, in the QHP plan. Now we can't we can't have much say um, over. Well, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. So uh, in terms of the FPP, my uh, motion is um, to uh, one care must submit a report to the board on its progress relative to its targets for commercial payer FPP levels that one care set in accordance with its F FY21 budget order condition 15 and any FPP targets set according to conditions in the FY22 budget order. And I, my concern here, um, I think is underscored um, by, by the, the data yeah, that we've had before us, both in terms of the ACOs, uh, in terms of our staff presentation, and I'm referring to slides 66 and 67, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, but uh, so let me just start by saying that the ACO stated in, in their filing, quote, the pivotal first step in managing overall health cost growth is to transition the health system from one rewarding volume to one that rewards cost effective and high quality care. That's on page 45. But on slide, 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 slide 66 and 67, what we see is that in terms of FPPs, Medicare is at 51% of, of their payments. Um, Medicaid, depending on traditional or expanded, at 54% to 58%. And, and, only, uh, and for commercial, it's only 1.1%. And as board members, we saw through the um, <clears throat> rate review process that on a combined basis, insurers uh, were into fixed cap capitated fixed prospective payments at about a one, one and a half percent level. And so this just seems to me way out of balance. And so last year we did uh, have an order, uh, uh, condition 15 to kind of take a, ask one care to take a closer look at this and project out some targets with they, which they did. And for uh, calendar and, and for fiscal year 2022, they uh, hoped for uh, a 10.9% commercial uh, percentage in terms of fixed prospective payments. Um, we also, uh, so, so starting at that point, what all my order does or amendment does is just to say, okay, uh, one care, tell us, you know, uh, you know later this spring, they tell us how you're doing against that 2.9% benchmark that they put in place. It's not our benchmark. And so I'm starting at a very low point here of, you know, plus or minus 1% in terms of fixed prospective payments. You know, whether you, you look at, uh, you know, the, the hospital percentage or uh, through rate review, et cetera, um, and just kind of trying to grow that to a mere 2.9% in fiscal 2022, 
And then uh, after that, uh, one care gets a little bit more steep. I think they're looking at around 23% in fiscal 23. But I, I just recall the, 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 the differing positions um, in our rate review hearings where one of the uh, insurers basically said they had no willing pro uh, partners to work with on fixed prospective payments. And then during the hospital budget process, we had, a, had the head of uh, the University of Vermont Medical Center coming in and saying, I'm first in line. Just give me a, a proposal that is actuarially sound and they would be first in line to engage. Um, so, uh, so that's all my, this amendment does is base and, and it and it's complementary to the uh, segment in the staff recommendations at the very end of their recommendations, where they're looking really beyond fiscal 22 into 23 and 24 and setting up in in the manual reporting system. So, I, I, so this this amendment to me is transparency. You know, it's kind of, uh, you know, we can whistle, what was that phrase, uh, wh whistle by the graveyard of F FPPs on, on the commercial end, but but absent their full engagement, um, I, you know, I, I, I think if the whole effort of healthcare reform is severely weakened. So that's my motion. It's uh, uh, very simple. And uh, uh, Kara has so, a copy. So you keep saying how simple it is. Could you state it so that I know what your, your motion is? Yep, uh, I'll do it again. And Kara can put it up on the screen. Um, so the motion is, one care must submit a report to the board on its progress relative to its targets for commercial payer FPP levels that one care set in accordance with its fiscal 21 budget order, condition 51, and any FPP targets set according to conditions in the F22 budget order. Because it's quite possible by the time we get into the late spring um, in April that there will be some contracts, you know, for FPP uh, in, uh, uh, tied to the FY22 but uh, uh, 22 budget process. So that's that's my first proposal. Is there a second? I'll second for purpose of discussion. But my question is, I don't understand why this isn't covered by the reporting manual. Well, my 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 uh, insight is that it's it's not in the reporting manual now. This requirement for um, uh, the ACO to report on its commercial FPP rates. Right, but staff have indicated they're going to add it. So I don't think necessarily that you know they could have reporting on fiscal year twenty one as well as you know whenever it makes sense to do fiscal year 22. So that. No, I, I, I think that's fair insight, Robin. Um, there was, as I, I said earlier, some confusion because yeah. be, before, yeah. before my, this motion here and that verbiage at the end of the staff recommendations was one big order. And, uh, and uh, our legal beagle and staff kind of ended up dividing them. And then in the division, one of them ended up in the staff recommendations, uh, and and here I am, you know, with f fiscal 22. But I, um, so I, I get your point. Um, but you know, come April, uh, come April, I don't think there's anything specific that says that the ACO needs to report on their FPP uh, relationships with commercial um, for fiscal 22. I, I I'm not sure that's in the man manual now, so. Kara, if you are on this uh, call, if you could uh, post the language that Tom says you have so that the public could see it. So at some point I can open it up to public comment. Thank you. Board discussion on Tom's motion. I just need a minute to. I need. I need to look back at the staff conditions, so I'm gonna do that right now. You can okay. see that the the draft second motion is exactly the verbiage, you know, that is embedded in the uh, staff recommend recommendations that, you know, between 18 and 19, the last two 
recommendations. Is there other board discussion? And Robin, I can always come back to uh, board discussion after opening it up to public comment if that gives you more time. I don't have any. I mean, in principle, I think it's a good idea to learn more about what how One Care is trying to, you know, in, increase uh, commercial fixed payments and and have updates. Um, I think there's a lot of things that are in the reporting manual that the that the staff are working on, and it seems to me this is a great thing to include in that reporting manual. And um, you know, maybe it's something, for example, that we could add to what is reported in April when they come back for the revised budget. But in principle, I don't have I don't have any problem with this. Okay, at this point, I'll open it up for. Uh, public comment on the motion? Mr. There... Chair, before you do, I think I can provide a staff clarification. Okay. If that's helpful. It's always helpful. I think the difference is that we are going to have, uh, or we had already planned to have the ACO come back and report to us on the um, baseline FPP levels and um, their um, methodology for calculating that and the target. Um, that's a reporting requirement. I think what's different is now that I see Tom's language um, in the, his second motion there, um, the part that says GMCB staff will approve or modify and approve a commercial SPP target and seek twice annually reporting. I think the idea that we will um, accept and approve um, those targets um, is what would be a condition of the budget. Um, Russ, if you have any additions to that, or if you think that I've clarified, um, please jump in. And I apologize if this got muddled. Yeah, thank, thanks, Marissa. I'm happy to jump in. And um, but I, I agree with what you just said here. The um, and there has been a, a little bit of back and forth and discussion around these two um, as additions to to the. Um, whether they go as part of the budget order or part of the reporting manual. And I think we can largely do that in, in either place. Uh, what's covered under the first motion seems to fit quite well with um, in the list of items that uh, One Care is required to come back and present on in the spring in connection with their revised budget. Uh, what fits in the second motion largely is can be covered in the reporting manual. Um, the specifically the the requirement to have staff um, approve or modify and approve a commercial FPP target uh, with respect to to one care um, that seems a, a little bit beyond the scope of the reporting manual and that was um, the thought of having it as a, a budget condition. Tom, I'm but, functionally, but, so, and let, let me just make it make it clear though that the the language in uh forget my amendment for my motion for amendment the, the language in the uh staff recommendations um is exactly that wording so i'm reading i'm reading from the uh staff recommendations and it says based on this reporting green mountain care board staff will approve or modify and approve a commercial fpp target and seek twice annual reporting from one care on progress toward the target. That's what that that's what they want in the manual, um, and it's the exact same it's the exact same language I had here. So that's why I'm withdrawing essentially the the second motion because it's a, it's extraneous. If it's going to be, you know, um, uh, as as stated in the uh, uh, staff recommendations. So let me just be clear that. Let me just be clear, Tom, that I'm hearing you say at this time you're offering motion number one on the document that's on the screen in front of us. Yes. Okay. Marissa, go ahead. That may be where the error lies, and uh, Russ can tell me if not, but I think functionally, if you want us to just co collect that reporting that we've already collected, as in 
um, have a consensus report on where we are with FTP and where we want to go or where that where the ACO proposes that they're going and we just want to collect that information um, that's that's for reporting if you want um, to have them um, if you if you want to set a benchmark so to speak or a target on what they're supposed to meet um, and hold them to that as a condition of their budget I think that's the piece that needs to be um, a motion if I have yeah. that correct okay can so, I jump in when there's a pause yeah, I had already opened it up to public comment, but go ahead, Robin. <laughs> Sorry, you can do public comment first if you'd like. Okay. Um, I only see one hand raised, Mary Alice Bisbee. Okay. Uh, I just like where this is going. I, I don't think it's at all redundant to put in things that are going to make it more... Um, <laughs> more able for the for one care to comply with these requirements this is what we need and and it will help make any decision for whether we should ever ever uh, have a contract with them in the future even for one year and i hope you're not going to vote on that today thank you thank you mary alice is there any other public comment on the motion that's in front of us which is the first motion that you see on the uh, screen in front of you. Seeing none, I'm gonna turn it back to board member Robin Lunch. Robin. Thank you. Um, before I jump into Tom's motion, I just wanted to mention to Mary Alice, first of all, hello, it's good to see you. Um, and second of all, we're, we don't approve whether or not one care and the payers contract that is a that is between the payer and one care um, so i just wanted to make that clarification what we're doing is doing a regulatory review of what the programmatic and budgetary aco program is we don't have authority to say yes or no to the contracts um, that, so i just wanted to to clarify that um, so Tom, how about this as a friendly amendment? Could we amend uh, staff recommended condition nine, which is the condition which has the uh, the topics for the presentation of the of the revised budget when they come in? Um, what if we add a, a progress report on the commercial FPP or all the FPP levels for that matter? Um, into that presentation. So instead of having it be a second, a separate condition, we just we make it part of that presentation. So it's a little bit clearer about when it would come in. Well, uh, everything goes full circle. I um, mean, in my experience, this is where th this conversation started, <laughs> and it evolved into the amendment that I put before you um, and adding to the you know the the, the the language here in this in the second mm -hmm. motion. It's not my language, it's staff language. And I just agreed, to, hey, look, it, it looks friendly and compatible. Let's, you know, let's combine them. So um, taking the essence of my first motion and putting it in um, staff in as a, as, as a letter under number nine, I think is what you're suggesting. Um, that's fine with me. I, I just, you know, last year, the, um, uh, the condition 15 was something I drafted. And it was just in order to kind of begin to to get transparency on this commercial disconnect that I I feel I see um, during rate review and hospital review um, and absent engagement, serious engagement by the commercial folks. Um, the uh, ACO to me is is it, its effort is is undermined severely. So. Um, your your uh, substitute makes sense to me, and that that's where this conversation started with staff way you know way back when. Robin, could you restate what you believe the motion would be? Yes, and Russ and Marisha should tell me if they see a problem with this. Uh, but I would so I think the motion should be to amend condition nine to add a new topic. Uh, L, I guess it would be, um, which would be progress relative to the targets for 
the, the progress on commercial payer FPP levels, um, and then we could let, let the staff kind of wordsmith it beyond that. Maybe something like consistent with the um, reporting outlined by the staff. Yep. Is there any, do you guys see a problem with that timing or anything like that? Does that make sense to you? It makes sense to me. Okay. So I think that would be my, uh, my, uh, pr proposal to amend Tom's motion. Tom, I believe that you've uh, indicated that it would be a friendly amendment and let me just uh, repeat it to make sure that uh, both you and Robin and I are all talking about the same thing. One Care Vermont uh, must submit a proposal to the board So the, the motion is uh, to amend staff condition nine, which currently reads at its presentation of the revised budget and no later than April 30th, 2022, one care must present to the GMCB on the following topics. And to that list of topics, we would add uh, uh, a report on its progress relative to uh, its progress on commercial payer FPP levels as further defined by the staff and consistent with the reporting manual. And is that fine with you, Tom? Uh, yes, it is. So um, with that, um, is there any further discussion on the motion? So the motion in front of us is to amend condition nine to add L, which would be uh, progress on commercial FPP levels consistent with um, reporting um, as set by the staff. Is there any further discussion? If not, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. Um, does a board member wish to make a motion at this time? Before we, one. Tom, before you go to your next one, can we just, I want to, I have a question for Russ and Marissa about what they were talking about in terms of your second motion. I think that what would need to happen is that we would need to delegate authority for the staff to come up with that commercial FPP target. I don't know that that has to be in the budget order per se, but we would need to do that official delegation of authority. I think that is the legal issue. Is that right, Russ? Yes, that's right. Do you wish would to make a motion on that, Robin? Sure. Um, so I move that um, I move that the board delegate to Green Mountain Care Board staff to uh, specify and determine a methodology for uh, fixed perspective payment targets and um, uh, and I'm going to leave it at that uh, and amend and to also include in the reporting manual um, appropriate reporting on those targets. And again, I will open it up for uh, public comment. I think it's a, a very similar discussion to what was just had, but I don't want anybody to um, say they didn't have an opportunity for input. Does any member of the public wish to comment on the motion in front of us at this time? And I guess I'm out of order because I never asked for a second. Is there a second? <laughs> Is there a second to Robin's motion? Second. Thank you. Now we'll go to public comment. Is there any public comment? Seeing and hearing none, is there any further board discussion? This is uh, Mike Barber, can you hear me? We yes. can. Um, so uh, just 
the board does have the authority to, to delegate um, things to uh, any member, officer, or employee. Uh, I do think it would be best to specify who position or person we are uh, you are delegating to. Um, Sarah Kensler, for example, or her position might make sense. Thank you for that good feedback, Mike. Robin, would you like to amend your motion? I would. Sarah, what's your title? Because <laughs> I won't remember. Director of Health Systems Policy. Oh, that's easier than I thought. Thank you. Okay, I would like to amend my motion to be clear that the delegation of authority would be to the, uh, the Director of Health Systems Policy. And is that okay with the seconder, um, Member Holmes? It is. Is there any further discussion? Is there any further discussion? If not, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. Thank you. Proceeding onward, um, does a board member wish to make a motion at this time? I do. Proceed. Okay, so uh, we're skipping over the second motion and looking at the third motion. And uh, that motion is, and I'll, I'll give you some background after I read it. Uh, in consultation with the Board of Managers, recommend to the Green Mountain Care Board an actuarially sound analytical approach that the ACO can use to annually provide an estimate of the incremental growth of the Medicaid cost shift and the effect of such growth on ACO Medicaid benchmark trend rates relative to ACO Medicaid provider costs. Um, to me, uh, the cost shift is a major undercurrent in Vermont's healthcare financing arena and a negative one. Um, it, its scale is huge. Um, estimates for 2021 just for the hospitals is $264.6 million in Medicare cost shift, which we can't do much about, and $252.2 million in Medicaid uh, dollars uh, shifting on onto commercial payers. Um, it's important to understand uh, how it is, it is important to understand, and I don't think we have an understanding yet, as to how the cost shift flows through the ACO, which it does. Um, it's, uh, you know, uh, the impact of, uh, on Medicaid providers is something that I don't think there's a clear understanding of. The impact uh, on Medicaid and commercial to total cost of uh, care is something that, that uh, we don't have a clear picture on. <clears throat> and it's... Uh, you know, if we do move and are moving toward uh, um, the uh, kind of a management approach having to do with comparing ourselves to a bet, you know, the best ACOs uh, in the nation, it's important to understand uh, when uh, you know, the impact of the cost shift on Vermont's metrics relative to, to um, uh, other ACO metrics. We've also seen that, um, a, you know, we spent a lot of time with the Burns report, for example, you know, that uh, took a fairly good look at um, uh, the cost shift of H, uh, H H HSA by HSA or hospital for hospital. But I, but in terms of its of of its relationship with the ACO, um, it, it's not clear. Um, let me. So the question in, is why why did and uh, you know, I kind of like put this in the context of in consultation with the board of managers. And I did that because I, I view this as much an organizational effort as well as a technical effort. Um, and I think that the board of managers is a group of people that are, they're, they're very talented. Um, they are ones that, that have a vested interest in, in uh, the members of the board of managers in fixing the cost shift. Um, uh, Dr. Brumstead, although he's not the head of the ACO anymore, has twice written letters to DIVA, you know, kind of uh, talking about the cost shift and, and, and its negative effects. Um, and the talent is there. If you remember during the hospital budget process, 
uh, UVM Medical Center uh, was fairly clear at profiling the impact of the cost shift on their, their request for a charge increase. So I, I think the talent is there and the vested interest is there. And, um, um, and if a method can be found uh, to, to measure this uh, in incremental growth and its in impact on Medicaid uh, provider or effect on Medicaid provider costs, um, the, the providers in Vermont and the members of the board of managers all will be uh, better, you know, in, in a better condition. So, so A is technical effort to get a window into how the me Medicaid cost shift flows through the ACO, and B is to engage that with the board of managers, who both I think collectively have the talent to take on this uh, th this effort, have the um, uh, have the vested interest to take it on. And uh, um, so that's my hope is is to start a process that that allows us all to learn how the cost shift flows through the ACO. So Tom, I'll, I'll just, well, first of all, is there a second? I'll second so we can have a discussion about it. It makes sense. So Tom, I would uh, um, my first question to you would be. Um, the Green Mountain Care Board annually prepares a, a cost shift report. And can you just tell me um, what it is that you think um, is missing in that report that would come from this motion? Um, or is this just trying to shine another point of light on a problem that we all acknowledge exists? No, I, I, I think it's different. Um, it's it's more surgical that the, the, uh, the cost shift information that we put out is just for hospitals and it's at a grand scale um, here at the aco level you have um, a large portion of the aco's attributed lives are medicaid folks you know and therefore their benefits are you know i don't know how it flows through the the medicaid rate but my guess is that the cost shift is embedded embedded in the medicaid rate yet in terms of of the commercial payers very few, as we very few commercial payers um, uh, associated with the ACO. So, yes, there is a cost shift within the ACO. It's not parallel to the kind of the larger healthcare environment where that shift just goes on to the commercial. Um, uh, so, internal to the ACO, there is uh, um, a flow of the cost shift, and that's something I think that we need to understand. Just because it's 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 it, it can sap the ACO of its success. The ACO could be successful in saving money, but it just gets siphoned off by the cost shift. Um, so I, uh, I I just want to I, I I want the ACO to be successful. I don't want them to be um, uh, weakened by the cost shift. Um, and I but I think we need to understand how the cost shift flows through the ACO, which we don't. Tom, would you be willing to, I mean, since there, there has been a lot of work done on analyzing um, the cost shift, quantifying the cost shift. Um, you referenced the Burns data, which was presented. Um, there's the annual cost shift report. There's a payer differential report. There are existing resources that have done some analysis on the existence of the cost shift. I'm wondering whether or not you might be willing to accept a, a friendly adjustment, which would be using da existing data on the cost shift, um, describe the effect of the Medicaid cost shift on ACO Medicaid benchmark trend rates relative to ACO provider costs. So in other words, just suggesting that, you know, there is existing data, they could certainly do their own internal analysis if they so choose, but there's plenty of data out there. And I'm wondering if that might be what you're really trying to figure out is what is the impact on the ACO. So ultimately, that's what you really need. How they, which data resources they use. Um, you know, there are existing resources out there, so potentially they might be able to use that and just report on how it impacts, uh, particular, how does the ACO Medicaid benchmark trend rate, you know, affect the cost shift within the ACO for ACO. Uh -huh. Medicaid providers. 
I mean, that that's a simplification and 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 consistent. I I'm fine with that. Um, I just I just I I I, I the the my construct in my mind of this, and this is part of you know kind of a having somewhat of a political background or an awareness is is you got to get a constituency uh, to I mean a phrase in in my early career was don't agonize organize, and I do think that the BOM is a good place to because of the talent it has, because of the experience it has in having to deal with the cost shift uh, at the provider level. Um, it, it, but if, if you want to frame that in the context of using existing data, that's fine with me. I mean, I, I, I don't want them to go out and spend a lot of money doing a, a technical analysis. Um, so um, no, that's fine with me. I agree with you. There's a lot of information out there. So am I taking that that you have accepted a friendly uh, uh, amendment from the seconder? Uh, I'll always accept friendly amendments from the seconder. Okay. Is there further board discussion? I guess what I would say is I felt like the payer differential report did answer this question. So, you know, I hear you about the politics, Tom, but if the provider-led reform can't lead themselves in a productive way to recognize the challenges. Like, I don't feel like a condition that we put on is going to further that. Like, um, so I would let them figure that out on their own. Um, so that's just my comment. Is there further board discussion? If not, I'll open it up for public comment on the motion that's in front of us. And I'll call on uh, Ham Davis first. Ham? Uh, thank you, Kevin. Um, one of the things that I do uh, with this issue is I try and explain it to my readers. And I, <laughs> there's no way I can explain this. The cost shift, um, the cost shift is an integral part of what's going on and is driven by the fact that, that government pays less than the full share of the cost. The idea that you can just have, you can just sort of wave a, Tom wants to wave a wand and say, go away, you evil thing. Now, I, can't, I cannot make any sense out of that. The, 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 how is anybody supposed to take, you yourself, Kevin, you wrote a letter to the Vermont legislature asking them to reduce the cost shift by um, <laughs> uh, reduce the cost shift by increasing Medicaid payments to something close to the market value. You got blistered from one end of the place to the other. The yes, it was quite a love letter that I got back. Yeah, I, I, I know. And, and, and the, the thing is, and so you, what you've got is you've got a, a big cost shift coming out of Medicaid and a smaller cost shift coming out of Medicare. And the idea that you can just say, we want this to go away is strikes me is silly. I mean, I, and I don't think it's complicated at all. I think this issue as is, is as simple as dirt. If you just the, if you've got, if you've got a bunch of payers and some payers won't pay the real cost, then the costs have to, and you and you can't you can't destroy the system uh, by you, you can shut the system down, but then you don't have any health care. So what 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 are we supposed to? What am I? Tell me, help me out here, people. Okay, what? How do you just t take somebody on the street and explain this to them? Makes no sense to me. This whole discussion is it sounds like a fantasy. So um, let me respond to that. I I. Uh... I hear what you're saying because we're we're deep in the woods um, as we are, but I, I don't think we have to accept the cost shift, at least the magnitude of it or the incremental growth of it as God given. Um, um, there's there is a you know uh, the, <laughs> the yeah I think for example but 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 first I think we need a, a beginning to have, we need an organized constituency you know, that that does get organized and focused on trying to fix the cost shift. You're never going to make the $252 million of Medicaid cost shift go away. 
but but you, if we can control its growth or if we can mitigate it over a five year period, I mean, like for the benchmark, you know, we we give them last year's amount plus three and a half percent. I mean, what 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 miracle would it be if all of a sudden Diva was to say on Medicaid we're gonna we're going to take last year's reimbursement rates and increase them by uh, uh, by what they were in three and a half percent. That's something that is within the capabilities of, of state government. Um, if, if, if you look at their presentation to the legislature, it takes about $5 million in general funds matched with global commitment to uh, increase reimbursements rates across the board by 1%. So, but we're not at that stage yet where, where we have enough people um, with an idea on how to mitigate the cost shift to to move the needle. So um, I, I agree with you, Ham, we're, we're stuck in the mud, but um, I don't think we have to be stuck here. Okay, I'm gonna call on Dale Hackett next. Dale. Can you hear me? I can, yep. Okay, this always makes me nervous. I'm gonna to try to use a very simple example. The ACO has $15 million in costs I think it's saving the five million, so you're down to ten million dollars in costs. It's all Medicaid. However, the revenue resources coming in is eight million dollars. What have you got? You're short two million dollars. You're gonna, by the time you subtract that, have three million dollars in savings. I think a piece got left out. Then you have to account for inflation because inflation is becoming quite significant in terms of what its effect can be. Um, I've seen some recent examples where inflation actually completely washes out any savings whatsoever, um, and that's extremely disturbing. It's so concerning because I approach it the wrong way and how I tried to want to take that $8 million and turn it into $10 million, I can be and end up asking the lowest income in the Medicaid population to pay more in percentage based on their income they live on than somebody at a higher income. This gets very problematic. I'm always excited to hear this discussion. I'm always nervous about coming up with really bad solutions. Tom, is that some of what you were trying to get at? I know it's more complicated, but in a one minute comment, I can't get to the conclusions. You're and cutting off, Dale. Dale, you're cutting out. Oh, sorry. Did you have anything further to say, Dale? Uh, that's it. Thank no, you. You're welcome. Is there other public comment? Mary Alice Bisbee. Yeah, I just wanted to to say that the way that the commercial insurers are getting money is by upcoding. I don't know if you folks know anything about upcoding, but that's how they're getting their money. And uh, for Medicare people like myself, I'm paying uh, a whole lot of money for my co-insurance. I don't have Medicaid, but um, you know, when you're you're paying $239 a month for your co-insurance through United Healthcare, which is the most uh, um, the best health insurance company for for their profits, if you're on in the stock market. I, I think it's important to remember these things that we do have different levels of of uh, income and uh, that we do owe something to people who don't have enough money to buy insurance. That's it. Thank you, Mary Alice. Is there other public comment? Hearing none, I'll I'll go back to uh, board discussion. Is there any further board discussion on the motion in front of us? I was thinking that maybe we could just simplify the motion in front of us uh, again. 
Is that all right? As another second you friendly try. amendment? <laughs> okay. Um, I'm wondering if, if Tom, this would, would be satisfactory to you. Uh, in the reporting manual, this would be in the reporting manual, uh, describe the effect of the ACO Medicaid benchmark trend rate on the cost shift. And it doesn't matter where the, I mean, they, they, we're not going to prescribe where the data comes from or what analysis they do, uh, but just a, the outcome you want is you want to understand the impact of that benchmark trend rate on the cost shift. So we asked them for that. Yes, I, 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 I mean, I don't think we have a clear vision as to how the cost shift flows through the ACO. Um, so, um, but I, I'm interested in that as a technical matter, but also interested in it in terms of giving hope to people for that and providers, et cetera, that are negatively affected by the cost shift, you know, that things can change. Um, and uh, so that's kind of, but I, I, what the direction you're going just doesn't, is consistent with that. So just to be clear, I believe what I think the motion is, is in the reporting manual, describe the effect of the Medicaid cost shift and the effect of such growth on ACO Medicaid benchmark trend rates relative to ACO Medicaid provider costs. Is that correct? I was literally going to simplify it to, in the reporting manual, describe the effect of the ACO Medicaid benchmark trend rate on the cost shift. Okay. So let me repeat that back in the reporting manual. Describe the the effect of the Medicaid cost shift. Well, I was going to say of the ACO Medicaid benchmark trend rate on the cost shift. Okay. And Tom, so, is that agreeable to you? I just want to understand it. So, um, and I, I know that this is hard to do. Uh, um, I, I, the machinations I went through writing the motion, you know, I, I appreciate what you're trying to do, Jess. But so you, so the, the Medicaid, so you, what you're saying is the impact of the Medicaid trend rate on the cost shift. I would think it might be the other way around, the impact of the cost shift on the Medicaid trend rate. Um, because my guess is that embedded in the in the Medicaid trend rate is the cost shift. So, you know, if you can take the Medicaid trend rate and break it down, pull it apart in terms of, you know, how much of it is uh, shifting, cost shifting onto others, and how much is 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 there to cover cost. Um, does that make sense? Sure. So it's just be to reverse those two words. Is there further discussion? Not knowing one way or the other if this is going to uh, be a unanimous uh, vote, I'm going to ask legal to call the names. Thank, thanks, Mr. Chair. I'll call the uh, do a roll call vote in alphabetical order. Uh, Member Holmes? I'll say yes. Uh, Member Lunge? No. Uh, Chair Mullen? No. And member Pelham? Yes. Okay. Uh, with only two with only two yeses, that doesn't pass. I'm let sorry if that's your prerogative, Mr. Chair. <laughs> yeah. Let the record show that the motion failed. Tom, do you have another motion? Yeah, one more. Um I'll try to be as quick as I can on this one. I, I it's it's the longest motion. I don't know how it got this long, but it's the simplest concept. Is, is that um, there, there's a one a, a once not in a lifetime, but there's a once in a rare event that uh, we get to take a look at a um, 
health care plan that serves a distinct segment of our population in, in terms of the individual and small group you know, uh, populations. And uh, uh, the legislature has set us on a trail to take a look at the um, Essential Health Benefits Benchmark Plan, which for Vermont, I think, was adopted back in 2014 and kind of predated um, a lot of the healthcare reform efforts that have unfolded since. Um, and it, and uh, I, uh, you know, it, the, the report um, from DFR and other stakeholders is due Jan January 15th. And I just thought it would be helpful uh, because during the hearing, when I asked whether or not One Care was engaged uh, in as a stakeholder in the um, essential health um, benefits benchmark plan review, the answer was they weren't at that point in time. I don't know if they've, they've done so since, but at that point in time, they were not engaged. And so it seemed to me a disconnect between an effort that was going to structurally change or may structurally change the benefits available to the QHP population, which in terms of our attributed lives is 30,000 lives, to have, have the ACO staff that is concerned about population health and prevention disconnected from that effort. And so the, 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 the purpose of this motion, um, and I'll read it if you want me to, the purpose of this motion is to make sure that connection is in place and that we as a board benefit from the ACO's insights as to the uh, recommended changes or not changes um, in, the, in the benchmark plan. I think it's important that you uh, state your motion. All right. <clears throat> to ensure recommendations for revisions to the Vermont H, uh, Essential Health Benefits Benchmark Plan support the ACO strategic plan to reduce cost growth or improve the quality and overall care of enrollees in the individual and small group markets within one week following DFR's presentation to the board recommending changes in the Vermont's Essential Health Benefits Benchmark Plan, One Care shall submit a report to the Green Mountain Care Board that addresses whether the proposed Essential Health Benefits Benchmark Plan is appropriately aligned with Vermont's health care reform goals of cost and quality regarding population health and prevention as set forth in Vermont All Payer Accountable Care Organization Model Agreement and the Department of Health State Health Improvement Plan 2019 to 2023 and identifies which revisions enhance or detract, if any, from the ACO's efforts to enhance affordability and improve population health and prevention. Is there a second? Is there a second? So I'm not hearing a second. So unless someone speaks up, um, I'll consider I'll that the motion is failed. Tom, do you have another motion? No, I'm done. Okay. <laughs> Does any other board member have a motion? I do. Um, and I will just briefly, I just want to explain that I, the reason why I was not interested in seconding the EHP. Um, Robin, if you could just hold up a second, whoever 802793, um, I don't have the rest of their digits, but if they could silence themselves. Great. Thank you, Robin. Go ahead. Sure. Um, you know, I think one care is welcome, and I do welcome them to submit submit a public comment in the EHB process. But I personally didn't want to prioritize one stakeholder over uh, all of the stakeholders that are involved in that group. It's um, I hope also that they are participating, and I do hope they submit a public comment. But I wouldn't require it. So that's just you know sort of my thinking on that. But I appreciate the spirit. Um, 
So what I would like to do is move um, to accept the staff recommendations as uh, presented in the December 22nd, uh, 2021 document and amended today um, by our previous motions uh, and to add uh, an additional condition um, which would in codify essentially the GMC reporting manual process. And, um, and I, I think it would probably be easier to just ask staff to uh, create that condition based on the understanding that the idea is that uh, we would have one care submits reports and information in con in accordance with the reporting manual which would be developed maintained and revised by staff and in scope of the rule and the law is there a second second is there discussion on the motion I'll open it up to uh, public comment. Is there any discussion on on the uh, any public comment on the motion in front of us? Seeing and hearing none, I'll throw it back to the board for any further discussion. If not, the the motion in front of us is. Um, I believe the final motion, um, which is adopting the, the, the staff recommendations as amended um, through the earlier motion of um, Member Pelham and adding um, the um, reporting manual language as specified by Member Lunge. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion carried unanimously. Marissa, Sarah, and team, um, I know you've put a, a lot of hard work into this and uh, it's truly appreciated. And uh, thank you for all that you do um, every day on behalf of Vermonters. With that, is Thank there any? Chair. With that, is there any old business to come before the board? Kevin Ham has his hand raised. Oh, this is just a plea for mercy, Kevin. Can you say whether the whether the the vote that you just took um, establishes changes the ACO budget in any way in, in terms of the actual money that goes to them? It, it changes. Um, the amount of money that they will have to expend on um, initiatives like um, um, quality. I'm not, I don't think it provides them with any additional revenue if that's what the point you're trying to make. I, I, yeah. well, I'm just trying to find out whether it, it I don't, and I, I, the press needs to know this too. They have a budget. Did the budget get, did the budget get passed or cut? The budget got passed with conditions that um, required them um, not to cut um, uh, expenditures on um, public health and quality as had been proposed. Well, that, 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 that's fine. I, any budget can have conditions in it. I just wanted to know whether it was actually, whether an actual cut was made. I, not that there was any reason to. I just wanted to see that and if, and, and trust me, it, any reporters that have, have to put the story out today about this will want to know that question. Thank you very much. Marissa, did I miss something in my answer? No, I don't think so. Mr. Okay. Chair, if I may, the only thing that I would add is that in the spring, once the contracts and attribution are finalized, we, we, we as, as required in these conditions, one care will be required to come back um, before the board and to provide us with um, an updated revised budget. Um, so the numbers that you see in the spring will be different based on what those final contracts say and what the final attribution is. So I, I just want to make it clear that that 
that change is anticipated and and will be based on kind of whatever the final the final contracts say. Uh, Kevin, that was a hundred percent clear. I got it. We'll have to have Sarah answer your questions and not me, Ham. <laughs> Kevin, no good deed goes unpunished. You're finding that out, buddy. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. Is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none. Um, in these dark days of the pandemic, um, there's a lot uh, of concern and, and a lot of um, um, reasons that someone may wish to find unhappiness, but I just want to say that even in these dark days, there's a lot of good things that we see in people. We see it in all the providers that are around us, and we see it when we hear news like today where um, the FDA has approved the uh, emergency authorization use of the um, Pfizer treatment drug. We see it in some promising news articles about the possibility that um, the Army is close to um, developing a vaccine that would actually cover the full spectrum of coronavirus. And so there are so many things for us to be happy about, so many things for us to be happy about here in Vermont, where Vermonters look out for their neighbors, look out for their loved ones. And especially in these holiday times, you know, be kind and to continue a, a tradition at the Green Mountain Care Board, if I can find the little button, which I probably won't be able to. Probably won't be able to. Happy holidays, everybody. Best wishes for a great holiday and for a much better 2022. I move we adjourn. I second. It's been moved to adjourn. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Happy holidays, everyone. Be safe. Happy holidays.